o tēnā tātou katsua, ki a tātou e hui tahi nei, i rāda tūni o tēnei whare. No mai, hara mai. Just like the earthworks going on outside here, I'm just providing a bit of a foundation, making sure that um, we can get off to a good start today, uh, even though it was a tragic end to our week last week. Uh, I'll, I stand here before, before you uh, representing Ngāti Whātua Rākei, and uh, I bring their love and their condolences uh, to those, anyone that's been affected by this tragedy in Ōtautahi. I know we have representatives from uh, Christchurch City Council, so kai te mihi tonu ki a koutou o Ōtautahi, mā te atua hei manaki, hei te aki. When I finish, so how this is, is folding out this morning, I thought it might be appropriate that we uh, spend a minute uh, as we before we start our week and going rushing about, but thinking about those who are, are suffering today and are in stolen mourning and in shock, and just to get us thinking in the right in the right place. I thought it'd be appropriate if we could have a minute's silence. We'd probably start off with that and then we'll build on that uh, this morning. So let's take a minute to just reflect. Thank you. Do, and it's a welcome. It's a prayer for all those new immigrants that are taking, becoming citizens of New Zealand. Aotearoa. So I thought it's appropriate uh, this morning, as our opening karakia. I'll read the first two verses. God of nations, at thy feet, in the bonds of love we meet. Hear our voices, we entreat. God, defend our free land. Guard Pacific's triple star from the shafts of strife and war. Make her praises heard afar. God, defend New Zealand. Men of every creed and race, gather here before thy face, asking thee to bless this place. God, defend our free land. From dissension, envy, hate, and, corrup and corruption, guard our state. Make our country good and great. God defend New Zealand. I'm going to keep reading it. Peace, not war, shall be our boast. But should foes assail our coast, make us then a mighty host. God defend our free land. Lord of battles, in thy might, put our enemies to flight. Let our cause be just and right. God defend New Zealand. Let our love for thee increase. May thy blessings never cease. Give us plenty. Give us peace. God defend our free land. From dishonour and from shame, guard our country's spotless name. Crown her with immortal fame. 
God to feed New Zealand. May our mountains ever be freedom's ramparts on the sea. Make us faithful unto thee, God defend our free land. Guide her in the nation's van, preaching love and truth to man, working out thy glorious plan, God defend New Zealand. May this be our prayer, and not only for today, but as we look back into our history, um, it wasn't me that wrote this, but some, somebody had the fortitude to, to put these words. So this morning I share with you, may it be our prayer that God defend New Zealand. Not only ngā mana i ngā reo, rauranga tirama. Ka mea na mātou tūpuna, hea ha te hau e wawara e wawara. He tiu, he raki, he tiu, he raki, nā nā ia mai te pūpū taraki i, ki uta. E tiki nga tu e au te kotu ko ia te pau, te pau whakaaro ka tū ki te waita matā i oku wairangi e. Nō reira, kia koutou, mai ngā hau e whā, kua tau mai nei. Nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai. Nā wai wai tapu kei wai ngani a koutou, a tēnei te mihi nunui ki a koutou. Nō reira, ka hori anō ki a rātou kua whetirangi tia. Rātau kua ti rama rama mai, nā whetū i runga te rangi. Haere koutou, haere koutou, a moi mai rā. Rātau ki a rātau, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate, tātau ki a tātau, te hunga ora. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi o ngā te whātua, ki a koutou, nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai. Hara mai ki tēnei, tēnei whenua o mātou, Tēnei wāhi me ki tāmaki mā kaurau, here ngā waka, tāmaki mā kaurau, here ngā tangata. Nā reira, nei rā te mihi ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā tātou katoa. On behalf of, I stand here this morning and welcome you from Nga Te Whātua o Rākei. One of the sayings that our Tupuna had was He Ate Hau. Talks about the British actually coming to this place. But it also talked about uh, looking further ahead to other people coming to this place of Tamaki Makoto. Tamaki, the place where the waka gathered. Tamaki, the place where people gathered. And so today, it is you that is, has come. Some different faces from the four winds. And so we welcome you once, we welcome you twice, we welcome you three times. In that saying, it talks about what is this wind of change that is coming. And climate change is coming. And so this is the wind that you're going to be talking about. The wind of climate change that is coming to our place, to this place of Tamaki, to Aotearoa. And so we welcome you once, we welcome you twice, we welcome you three times. We turn to those loved ones who have passed, especially those in, that were tragically taken on Friday. But those of you who carry in your hearts and minds loved ones who have passed in the recent weeks, months, or even the past year, we farewell them. May they rest in peace. But to the living who have arrived this morning, I welcome you once, I welcome you twice, I welcome you three times. Nō reira, i ngā mana, i ngā reo, rauranga tiri mā huri no tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I was hoping my CEO from Ngāti Whātua Whai Mai was going to be here, because she's got a better singing voice than I do. But um, here's, a, here's a short waiata, and it's a waiata that, that our auntie wrote uh, while standing on the, on the shores. And as the ebb and flow, uh, the ebb of, and flow of the tide came in and went out, she was reminded of those uh, people who have come, 
and those people who have gone. And so today, as we, as we remember those uh, you have come today, we welcome you. We farewell those who have gone. And the song goes something like this. <clears throat> Papa ki mai Nga ngaru nunui Wa waratia Nga tairere Eri poe Nga ngaru nunui Here utai Hai ku Taira Orera inga mana Inga reo Rauranga tira ma huri no tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a kia ora tātou katsua. Kuro. Rama. Ora, tēnā sēnā. Iwe. O tēnē, ata marie. Peaceful morning to you. And thank you for your uh, very generous welcome to us this morning. And um, I, I don't think um, <clears throat> any of us will be um, able to quite um, sing the national anthem again um, without remembering uh, the extraordinary resonance that you found in it for us today. Victorian words um, of a particular culture and time, um, but sentiment um, that guides us in all our great diversity in Tamaki Makoro um, in this time forward. And thank you for your very generous welcome because um, it was the gifting of the land here by Natifato Orake um, that. Um, began this great uh, adventure of Tamaki Makoro. Uh, that was only September the 18th, 1840. Um, we're barely 20 years away from our bicentenary with lots to do um, to make this uh, truly, uh, deeply, and inspiringly a very sustainable city of which the climate change we're discussing today and our responses to it is only part of it. Um, I'm Rod Oram, and it's my um, very great pleasure to be your, um, and privilege to be your MC this morning. Um, first on the program was um, Mayor Phil Goff, but um, very wonderfully over the weekend, the girls of Zaid College in Mangare asked, <clears throat> asked him to come and visit this morning. So that's where he is, and... Um, I'm sure we all feel that that's absolutely the right um, decision for him to go there. Um, and in due course, I will um, introduce the very wonderful Councillor Penny House, who is going to welcome you instead on behalf of the Council. Um, it is very um, right, of course, that Phil's there, because Tamaki Makoro is the um, fourth most immigrant-intensive city in the world. Toronto and Vancouver are one and two, uh, which are examples of how um, um, cities like that do it well. Brussels is number three, which is a hellhole, which has got nothing to do with the European Union being headquartered there, <laughs> um, but of about failed um, ethnic policies within Belgium <laughs> before they started taking in um, immigrants. And so um, in Auckland, as the fourth most immigrant intensive city in the world, uh, we are the world um, in a very real sense. And therefore, uh, for us to gather today to work on um, climate change as a truly global issue, um, but find our own expression for how we might do that, how we will do that, um, is uh, completely appropriate. And um, as I say, we've probably got about 20 years uh, before we really have demonstrably very big progress to show on this. So I could imagine um, the bicentenary of Tamaki Makoro in September uh, 2040 uh, being um, a great time of uh, celebration. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, please check your mobile phones 
are off or at least on silent. Um, but please feel free to um, tweet and otherwise communicate for good on social media um, uh, through the day. Uh, there is internet access. Uh, you'll find a network um, generator members um, and the username is Madden, i.e. the street outside, M-A-D-D-E-N. Oh, there it is up on the screen. Uh, Madden.events and then the password is generator at grid. Um, lots of photographs will be taken during the day and some might well be used, um, the most photogenic I'm sure, uh, by, used by the council in the climate action plan process. So um, if you have any concerns about that, please see one of the organizers. And they're easily identified because on, on their um, lanyards, uh, on their um, name tags, they have a green strip across the bottom. So just have a word with anybody who's got a green strip across the bottom. Uh, we're also live streaming, so uh, kia ora tato to everyone live streaming. And um, it's a great pleasure to have you um, with us um, this way uh, this morning. Uh, health and safety, in the unlikely event of an emergency, uh, the exit point is back down the stairs you came, up in this corner of the building, and uh, plenty of room to gather outside. Um, and uh, venue staff will be there to guide you. Bathrooms, this is a modern building. There's something of a challenge. Um, when you go into this corridor here, you will see one door which just says unisex bathrooms. And I've been here before where large queues have formed at that door because people think there is the bathroom. But inside there are eight beautiful little self-contained suites. <laughs> so do explore beyond that first door, otherwise, you know, unforeseen circumstances might overrun things. Um, so um, that's the bathrooms. Uh, this is a very unfortunate juxtaposition. Um, all our hospitality, food and drink, morning tea, lunch will be in the um, area behind you there. And um, lastly, just to repeat, um, the um, symposium organizers from the council, led by John Morrow, the council's chief sustainability officer, are around. They're here to help, and um, they've got that uh, crucial piece of green um, on the bottom. What this is about today um, is um, the, a, a very complicated program <laughs> over three days. Um, this is uh, to progress um, the, climate ac um, the Auckland Climate Action Plan for the city. We've had the big target already. This is about um, developing some very specific steps. So we've got this conference today and then tomorrow there, um, there are five um, sort of flagship uh, initiatives which are under development, so they are workshopping more. Um, but there is an urban growth and climate change panel with the Ministry for the Environment. There's the Just Transitions uh, gathering. There is the Great Intergenerational Food Transformation. Um, there is Talk, Act and Achieve Climate Action, led by Generation Zero, completely appropriately. And very importantly, um, there is a sustainable finance session tomorrow, uh, led by Aotearoa Circle. Um, I know of no other country in the world in which business has, um, the leaders of business, in um, tandem with government and NGOs, have committed to um, developing natural capital um, as the center of their capitalism. So an extraordinarily important moment when Aotearoa Circle was launched in November last year, and their first um, strand of work is on sustainable finance. Um, then we go for, forward uh, on to Wednesday where there's more development of those flagship products. Uh, there's a community hui, hui and there's a whole section on um, climate change risk assessment before we have um, the final climate symposium close on Wednesday afternoon. So this is a very important uh, part of the process this day um, in terms of uh, a very full program um, of um, speakers and insights and uh, that will take us through that. Um, I will stop at that point and then welcome um, Mayor, uh, oh, I said Mayor, Deputy Mayor originally, it's wonderfully councillor, Penny Hulse, um, who's the great champion of all this in this council and councils before. So a huge welcome please for Penny. Thanks very much indeed. Inga mana, inga, inga reo, e rauranga te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Assalamu alaikum and kia ora 
Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. I want to acknowledge the wonderful Otini for his most beautiful welcome. This um, blessed man is, is such a gift to us in, in Auckland. And again, the warm welcome from Ngāti Whātua to everyone from everyone Ngāhoe Whā from the Four Winds is well meant and said with love. Talking of love, I want to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues, Councillor Richard Hill, Councillor Chris Darby, Councillor Paul Young, who are here as councillors, and we in the rohi of the mighty Pipakum, our chair of the Watamata Local Board, and this woman has done for climate change what no other elected member, I think, has done. She bikes everywhere. This woman is an absolute champion, and Pippa, we acknowledge you. I also want to acknowledge everyone who's here, and I can't stand here um, without some words about where we are all at, I think. On Friday, our youth marched. 1.5 million children marched, close to 2 million. 1.5 million registered, I think over 2 million marched, in 2,000 cities and towns around the world in 125 different countries. That was our Friday morning. Our Friday morning was filled with hope and our youth. And then on Friday afternoon, everything changed. It just simply changed. And I don't even think there are words to describe that change. We lost 50 beautiful souls in prayer in a place where they should have been safe and loved. Our young people are calling out to us to act to save the planet. And by Friday evening, we realized we actually needed to save ourselves. We needed to save ourselves from Islamophobia, from racism, from hatred, from all of the other phobias and negative thoughts that we've allowed to swirl and build those guns. So today, all of that comes together in this room. And out of this kind of horror and confusion, I think will actually come good. It, it is sometimes the best time to act when we go, this is not time for politics and words. This is not time for small and venal issues. This is not time for procrastination and letting things ride or looking at the sides of the debate. This is simply time to act and change. You're here, you're in the right place, you're in the right time. And I think we need to dignify the hugeness of everything that we're feeling as a nation at the moment by simply committing to make that change. About six or seven years ago, we stood just down the road as we launched the Auckland Plan, and um, the picture of me with my then one-year-old grandson popped up on Facebook, which is the only way that we ever know how history passes, by what appears on Facebook. And I kind of held Jack as the, you know, the symbol of what we're going to do with the Auckland Plan. And I want to reassure people that Auckland Council has not sat on its hands. We've done a truckload of stuff since then. And I want to acknowledge um, Chris Darby, who's now taken over chairing the Auckland Plan and the, and the iterations thereafter. We've reduced our resilience on, we're working to reduce our resilience on fossil fuels. We've divested ourselves of our, our investments in anything to do with fossil fuels, which is great. You know, we're doing some practical stuff. But through the Auckland Plan and then what followed the Unitary Plan, we've enshrined ourselves as a compact city. And we're battling a valiant battle, I have to say, with, with some forces in government to say, do not remove the urban rural boundary, do not build on the outskirts of Auckland, and do not condemn us to a, a carbonated future based on, on car travel and living in transport poverty, as Chris Darby so eloquently puts it. We're working to make those changes but we are still, for every electric car sold, we're still buying around 64 double cab <coughs> diesel utes. You know, we have to change things remarkably quickly to turn these figures around. We're still putting in Auckland um, four, 144 kilograms of waste in the ground for every Aucklander. That is just abhorrent. So we've got much to do, but we do have plans. We do have things that are happening, and we do have those levers available to us that are turning this great big ship around. Our zero waste plan aims to reach zero waste by 2040. Our demolition firms are now turning into deconstruction firms, which is a passion of mine, and we are having some of our very large projects being deconstructed, not demolished. These are small changes, but they make big impact. We're pedestrianising streets. You know, who knew? Close High Street, close O'Connell. Just get the damn cars out and get the people in. That stuff is suddenly 
easier to do than it was. And I think if we ramp things up again by this symposium, I think, as we've said before, I know Chris and Richard and Pippa and I have said, let's just get the plastic barriers down and close more streets. Let's make those transformative and incremental changes that will allow Aucklanders and New Zealanders to see a different future. Because we are seeing our region impacted by climate change, and you'll be seeing that around the rest of New Zealand. I know in Dunedin and South Dunedin, you're seeing the difficulties that you're having managing storm waters, storm water, because the sea level rise is actually visible now. We're having coastlines eroded here. Tamaki Drive, some people which would like to see as untouchable and um, precious because of the value of the houses around it, is being impacted by climate change. Yep. Climate change doesn't care, doesn't care how big your house is, how flash it is, it's coming your way and we're seeing it happening right now. We can no longer ignore it. So I want to do a big shout out to our climate change team, our sustainability team and our, what I fondly like to call our pointy heads, who are doing the really clever thinking and that's said with love and aroha and affection because that's where the clever stuff happens. This is the stuff that puts down on paper what is actually happening in our cities and in our regions. It quantifies it and it allows politicians like Paul and um, Richard and Chris and Pippa and myself to argue the arguments we need to do things differently. And more of that over the next couple of days where we will honestly show you some of the work that's being done. It's no time for hiding under rocks, it's no time for hiding behind what might be politically un unpalatable, and it's no time to allow our communities to be patronised by not showing them what's happening out there in the real world. This is the kind of symposium that's needed to do that work. I want to thank you again most warmly. I particularly want to, as we seem to have done so many times over the years, express my love and aroha to our Christchurch communities. This is very, very hard for you. You must be tired of being shouted out to. But we do it and we say it with love because what's happened in your community could happen anywhere unless we fundamentally start to love our community and love our planet. And I want to acknowledge our extraordinary Prime Minister who you're going to hear from shortly. If ever loving leadership was embodied in a single leader, it's that woman. And I want to publicly state my admiration that I don't even have words for, for this wonderful, wonderful leader. And I hope you'll enjoy her presentation. To all of you, thank you for being here. Thank you for making the time at this challenging time to be here. Thank you for undertaking to be the people who will change the planet and change our community for good. Kia ora, thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Penny, um, for that, um, again, um, very heartfelt and um, um, I inspiring uh, welcome to us for this work. Um, next up, we have uh, indeed a, a, sh a short video from the Prime Minister. Needless to say, this was recorded before the events of Friday uh, and very much focused on um, our work here. So I'll leave her to speak for herself. Thanks. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm really excited by this symposium and the impact that it will have on shaping Auckland's future. Climate change is the issue of our time. It's our challenge to do our bit and limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We know that this will require considerable change in all sectors of the economy and right across society. And while taking action on climate change will bring broader benefits for our economy and environment and well-being, 
we need to make sure that we take the right approach. Now, this means making sure we work together to ensure our transition to a net zero carbon emissions economy is fair, that it's inclusive, that it's productive, and that it's sustainable. Now, I'm a child of the 1980s, and I frequently reflect on a period in our history where we saw dramatic transformation of our economy. And as a government, we are committed to ensuring that we don't see that jarring impact on communities again, that instead we plan the transition that is so necessary for our climate and for our economy. Our Climate Change Minister, James Shaw, will talk with you in more detail about our climate change legislation work, building an understanding of the risks nationwide and planning for adaptation when he closes uh, this climate symposium on Wednesday. But I thought I'd take a moment to talk about why it's so important for Auckland specifically to take action. Auckland currently represents around 20% of New Zealand's emissions. We need Auckland to succeed for New Zealand to succeed in transitioning to a zero carbon climate resilient future. As a growing city, Auckland's focus needs to be on making decisions now that do not lock the city into a carbon intensive and risk exposed future. This means focusing on how and where the city grows, the benefits of transport choices, and innovation in our energy and infrastructure systems. It's really great to have such a wide range of people and organisations coming together at this symposium to talk about these issues and share their views to help shape Auckland's future, the city that I call home. The symposium's agenda reflects the benefits that can be generated through climate action, such as improvements to health and intergenerational equity. It's also fantastic to see that for the first time, work has been done to prepare a localised climate change and risk assessment, which will look at specific risks for Auckland and support decision making in this area. Finally, though, I'd like to really congratulate Auckland Council's leadership in committing to a 1.5 degrees Celsius compliant emissions pathway. I wish you all the best for the rest of the symposium, and I look forward to hearing more about your discussions. Thank you for being a part of this incredibly important transition for New Zealand's future and for the next generation's future. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I'm not sure we got the protocol right about uh, recorded um, uh, messages, which is wonderful. Uh, somehow we feel slightly nervous, I think, about actually applauding a video. <laughs> um, but well, no, so, yeah, go ahead. Because uh, if uh, the Prime Minister was here, you'd have no doubt have expressed your um, <laughs> thanks for her uh, supporting message there. Um, just by way of um, saying a few words to uh, tee up um, some of the thoughts about um, our work um, today, uh, the humankind passed a very important milestone in 2007. That was the year that the United Nations deemed that now 50% of people lived in cities. Um, and uh, that ratio is uh, expanding really fast. So the UN thinks, roughly speaking, um, that uh, urban populations might peak at around about 80 or 85 percent of human population by about 2040 or so. So around the world, there's this extraordinary um, new build and rebuild of cities um, to accommodate that. There's good reason for that um, great draw of cities, um, because it is a place uh, when cities work well, where there is uh, extraordinary um, ability for people to connect uh, for economic, social, cultural, and all other um, sorts of ways. So a very, very strong networking effect there. Um, but cities are also uh, can be terribly evil and lonely places. Uh, there is a wonderful pair of uh, American sociologists that are, uh, a, a few years back wrote a, a book about that where they went around the world looking for what they called oases of sanity in a rabid world. And they identified a number of cities uh, which are hugely multicultural, um, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, cities like Marseille. Very interesting, the whole culture of Marseille is completely different from Paris um, in that respect. Um, a city that lives very, the people of that city in all their diversity live far more comfortably together than the people of Paris do. 
Um, and so uh, there is this uh, wonderful opportunity to be very intentional about how we create our cities so we can make them deeply, deeply sustainable in every sense of that word. Now, we're focusing on climate change today, but everything we do on climate change can contribute to that, has to contribute that to uh, those greater um, issues. Here in New Zealand, we're odd, actually we're weird, because um, we are more urbanized as a population than either France or Germany, but we continue to define ourselves as uh, New Zealanders by our wild and rural places, um, and yet uh, we are intensely um, and ever more so urban. Um, so uh, on top of all this, there is um, a real fabulous opportunity for us to uh, try to understand and give expression to what is um, a, a New Zealand expression of urbanism um, in all its great ways. Um, and of course that gets to be quite city and community specific within a city. Um, so with, uh, Tamaki Makoro, Auckland will, is and does feel different from Wellington or Christchurch and rightly so. But um, each community um, in Auckland um, has the um, a great opportunity to express its own um, sense of um, place. One last thing about all this is that um, if cities are to be so um, um, profoundly um, life-supporting, life-giving, um, we need to bring nature back into the cities. Nature was here before we paved it over. Um, and to a large extent, uh, all we've done is build little pocket parks or little gestures towards nature. Um, but through out this across the world, the enormous challenge is to bring nature fundamentally back into a city, um, not just so that we, for example, um, uh, produce some of our own food in cities, um, not just that um, we um, rely on nature, here comes a horrible word, for ecosystem services. So it's an important word, but it sounds so engineering specific. Um, and um, But above all, it's that nature um, truly inspires us in our urban lives um, and we feel that connection because if we don't feel that connection with the biosphere, our life support system, um, then the game really is over. And um, just looking around here in the Winyard Quarter, we're seeing some glimpses of that, um, trying to ignore the hole in the ground behind which is probably going below, down below sea level. We'll, we'll there are some juxtapositions here which are slightly awkward. Um, but, uh, um, but, um, but that sense that um, this incredibly beautiful place, uh, originally two harbors expanded to the bottom half of the Kuiper, thanks to the amalgamation of Auckland. Um, so two and a half wonderful harbors, fantastic um, bush uh, um, to the west and to the southeast with the Waitakeris and the Honuas. Um, this is a, a glorious, glorious place um, f to make um, uh, uh, our place our home and our future here. So um, we have lots of people contributing to that conversation today, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome up Abby Reynolds, um, who's Chief Executive of the Sustainable Business Council. Um, Abby's been doing and continues to do incredibly important work, um, helping um, business leaders um, step up to these issues, um, and um, probably looking around um, senior business structures around the world. Um, for my money, what's going on with our business leaders, uh, there's, a, there's a greater commonality and integration there across a large number of um, organizations, which Abby will uh, no doubt tell us about, um, which um, gives me great hope for the constructive role that business can play in this. So a very warm welcome to Abby, please. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ena mate, haere, haere. Hoki atu rā ki te pō. E tu whari, e tu mai nei, ena mana, ena iwi, ena reo, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I think like the other speakers, I'm feeling pretty personally confronted by what happened on Friday. And as someone who lived in London during the tube bombings, one of the lessons that I took from that is what is it that we need to continue to do in order to be able to be the best version of the community that we want to be? 
And for me, one of the things which this represents today, the coming together, the working collectively and taking action together on the things that matter to us is the most profound act of commitment to our community that we can make. So congratulations to all of you for being here. I am going to talk a little bit about what business is doing on climate change and the imperative for action, climate action from business, but I want to be absolutely clear with you that this imperative for action isn't some future state to which business will respond in the future. It's an imperative that is acting on businesses right now. A month ago, our climate change minister said this, the private sector in New Zealand society are way ahead of government and we need to catch up. I regularly hear sceptics tell me that businesses are only acting on climate change for reasons of greenwashing, or that actually fundamentally we're not acting because all we really care about is profit. I'm so certainly not going to argue with you today that business is in any way perfect. We're not. But we are on the journey. And not all businesses are on the journey, but the ones that count, I think, definitely are. And one of our greatest challenges is that the scale of the challenge that we face requires us to be working together. I've seen so much voluntary action from business and that's had to happen in advance of policy from the government because our business leaders are starting to understand this, that exact scale of challenge. In 2017, before this government was elected, a group of CEOs got together to have a conversation about what they could do collectively on climate change. They developed this statement, which is a CEO level commitment to action on climate inside their businesses. Initially, this was entirely business to business conversation. Businesses who signed up were talking with their customers, their suppliers, their partners to invite them to be involved too. And I think all of us who worked on this were surprised, profoundly surprised in fact, by how much appetite there was from businesses to sign up to this. It launched publicly on the 12th of July 2018 with 60 signatories representing nearly 50% of New Zealand's emissions and with many of our most well regarded and largest businesses signed up. There are other collective initiatives like this around the world but we are not aware of anywhere where such a significant percentage of a country's emissions is being represented. These are the signatories. It now numbers 82. It also includes councils, and you'll note that Auckland is one of them, and universities. Just take a quick moment to get a show of hands from those people in the room who are signatories to this, because I know there are a number here. Put your hands up. Almost 50% of the room, perhaps. <laughs> well done. What this slide doesn't represent is the enormous amount of work each of those businesses is doing on climate change. And I can only give you a really thin skate over the surface of this. But for instance, the warehouse in Sky City about a month ago both came out talking about going carbon zero. We've seen public announcements of collective tree planting efforts from the likes of Z Energy, Air New Zealand, Contact and Genesis. There's been so much leadership on electric vehicles in New Zealand from businesses encouraging the take up of, um, of vehicles like um, the Outlander as part of your personal fleet, but also organisations like Waste Management encouraging businesses to transition their heavy fleet. Uh, we've seen businesses who've committed to being carbon zero by 2030. That's 11 years, and in particular I'd like to acknowledge Vector. There's been so much work done by so many businesses that we don't see. And one of the things which is challenging for our business community is a real fear that if they haven't got all the answers and they start to talk about what they're working on, they will attract criticism at a scale that they, particu they don't particularly want to hear. So our businesses tend to stay quiet until they really feel like they've got it sorted. But underneath the hood, there's a lot of work happening. What is coming next? For the Climate Leaders Coalition is our anniversary, which will happen on the 24th of July. It will be celebrated at the Embark Low Emission Solutions event here in Auckland. So get that date into your diaries now. On this date, the signatories to the Climate Leaders Coalition 
will be asking New Zealand and New Zealanders to hold them to account. This is where they will show you what they've done and how they've met the commitments and the pledge that they made. And it's also going to be an opportunity for our businesses to come together and talk about and learn from each other about low emission solutions. There is so much great activity happening, but how we find out about it and learn and copy each other is a question we still need to answer. So what is this business imperative for climate action? As I said at the beginning, there are plenty of people who are sceptical about what business is doing and why. But actually for me, the fundamental answer is the CEOs I talk to, it's about the fact that they genuinely care. Their parents or their grandparents and they're wondering what it is that they'll be leaving for their kids. Many of them are New Zealanders and deeply committed to this place and they're motivated to work in ways where they think they can help. They are also trying to navigate the long-term future for their businesses. And they can see the really significant disruption that climate change poses. They are already starting to see the impacts on their business. One of my favourite examples of this is, Cli is Christchurch Airport. They used to own snow ploughs to, to clear the snow from the runway during winter. They haven't needed those for the last few winters and don't expect to ever again, so they've sold them. I also know of businesses who've talked about having key infrastructure flooded and they can point directly to climate change being the cause. Our businesses, business leaders are also feeling the second order effects, more expensive insurance. The number of people I've spoken to who've gone up to Europe to renegotiate their insurance to discover it's more expensive, not just because of our, our earthquake risk but because of the weather events that we are starting to suffer. There are also stories of the challenging business cases that businesses have to make for what will soon be out of date technology. If you need to buy technology which has an internal combustion engine, and you imagine that might only have 15 years of being relevant, it's much harder to make a capital case to buy it. And that's happening now for our businesses. So I genuinely think our businesses are acting because our business leaders know this is real and they are genuinely concerned. They are also acting because they know it matters to their customers and to their stakeholders. Those businesses that face the consumer are really motivated to understand and act on it. Our future customers marched on Friday throughout the country and the world. It's a pretty unequivocal signal about what matters. In Colmar Brunton's Better Future survey this year, over 50% of New Zealanders said they are very concerned about climate change. It's the first time it's got above 50% in Colmar's 10 years of surveying. The other thing that matters for our businesses, a growing group of investors who are signalling that they want this risk to be taken seriously, that those businesses that don't understand how climate change impacts their business over the long term are high risk investments. Globally, we have the Task Force for Climate-Related climate Financial Disclosures, which is setting a global standard for the level of investigation and reporting that businesses will increasingly be expected to do. And finally, one of the most significant imperatives for businesses is that it is an opportunity. Most of our businesses are organisations that are set up to think about how they solve problems how they deliver services. The transition to a zero carbon economy is going to require innovation at every point in the value chain. It's going to require new products, new technology and new business models. It's been estimated that this is worth somewhere in the region of 29 trillion US dollars. So a significant prize for those who can find answers. And I've heard it described as a bigger driver of innovation than the Second World War. Our best businesses can conceive of the role that they will play in shepherding in a low carbon economy. And I think that's what we need right now, smart, motivated people invested in finding solutions, taking risks and helping us all step into a low carbon future. 
because it's so important to hold on to the sense of what is possible. So much of our narrative about climate change is about fear and what we stand to lose. And so if we can catalyse the people who are going to find those solutions, find those innovations and who can create a compelling and attractive low carbon future for us, we will step into it all the more happily. And because in the last few days as we've been so amply reminded, we've got so much more than just climate change to navigate right now. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, thank you very much indeed, Abby, for um, telling us uh, the highlights of where <laughs> the Sustainable Business Council and the Climate Leaders Coalition is going. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of time, um, so if there's some questions for Abby, please um, uh, put your hand up. And there is a lady at the back there with a the microphone um, who will be able to race right to you. Um, let me just start, if I may. Um, to what extent um, are we starting to see businesses in New Zealand actually um, change the whole sort of model, the whole conception of what they're doing, as opposed to um, just sort of cleaning up their act, if you like. Yeah. And, and are, if yeah. there are some examples you could give us where there's actually been a sort of a conceptual shift about business, yeah. uh, that, would, that would be terrific. Yeah, I, look, I, that's probably one of my favourite things to think about, Rog. Um, I think one of the things which is so challenging for our businesses and our business leaders is so much of the way we think about and design our future is based on our history. It's based on looking backwards and what we learned about the past. And the challenge of climate change is the, 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 the urgency and the pace at which we will need to move requires us to have different ways of thinking and being. And so for me, one of the greatest delights is actually seeing our business leaders get their heads around the fact that this is that we are in a no more business as usual kind of context and that they will need to reconceive of their business models. For me, probably one of the best examples is Z Energy. Um, Mike Bennett is the convener of the Climate Leaders Coalition and he, he retails gas and he will willingly tell you that he's one of New Zealand's biggest emitters. But what I really admire about the way Mike is thinking about this is he understands that he has to find a way of um, transitioning his business to a future where they are not retailing um, fossil fuels anymore. So we've seen them take steps like they've invested heavily in Flick, which is an, an electricity uh, retailer. They are starting to investigate all sorts of opportunities that their businesses could um, engage in. So for instance, uh, every uh, everybody in New Zealand lives, with, or no, 80% of New Zealanders live within five kilometres of a Z service station. So they're starting to wonder about what that retail space could be used for, which could be part of um, a low carbon future. Uh, we have a, another business I work with which will remain nameless because their plan isn't in the public, but um, their CEO, when I started working with him initially, was talking about how um, people buying his services was going to help other people reduce their carbon footprint. And I watched him over two years go from that as his vision to actually having figured out how by 2050 he would have a zero carbon business for himself. So that's the kind of um, thinking we're absolutely starting to see more and more of, um, and it's the kind of thinking we're going to need, but it's hard. Uh, it, it is, but uh, wonderful. Uh, David, oh, you've got the microphone. Yes, uh, all yours. Uh, David Gallup from Counties Monaco. Uh, thanks, Abby. Um, I was interested to see James Shaw's quote on the on the screen. Um, you know, the, the the public sector of which I'm a part of, of course, does lag well behind business, uh, and it seems strange to me uh, with uh, the words of the Prime Minister um, quoted so often about how important mm. climate change is to her and to her government. Why is it that the government is so slow and what can you do to help them and to help us? Because it is very difficult where we're sitting. I would be speculating if I was to make any Speculate, statements about please. why government might be a bit slower than business. Um, uh, look, I think one of the most important things is that the election cycle doesn't help government take um, long-term perspectives for long enough. And actually for business, we need really long-term policy certainty. I also think that um, you know businesses are getting better at understanding that the context in which they're operating is more uncertain than it's ever been. And so um, I did have a conversation once with one business leader who said, actually, your response to being in a VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous context, is actually to really step into it and try and ride the tig tiger rather than holding onto its tail. So I think there's, that's part of what's catalyzing businesses, the, the, the context is becoming more uncertain. Um, I, 
the role of business to help government is a is a harder one um, because the thing about government is in theory it's a bit more of an homogenous whole whereas businesses are you know individual organizations who come together collectively from time to time but that's not what they're here for um, and so one of the things which we regularly talk about is how is it when there's such a pace gap and such a difference in approach that we can find ways of working together so contexts like this really matter and one of the things that I know we try and do for our members is make sure we're talking to government about the barriers um, we won't necessarily talk about what's going on in policy but we will say here are the things which business is facing which it's going to have to navigate these are the things we're going to need policy solutions for uh, if I'm, I might chip in a few thoughts of my yes, own please. on this but thank you for that Abby um, <laughs> Uh, I think by nature we would want governments to be uh, relatively conservative because they are the bulwark against disaster and things falling apart. Um, and um, however, within government there are some very innovative um, um, parts of agencies and agencies. And so I think that uh, the ability for, uh, or, or trying to get government to learn faster um, from its most adventurous members, I think, would be a great challenge. Um, the, the election cycle one is absolutely a factor, but the simplest way of solving that is not to um, increase the, uh, uh, the time between elections, because that doesn't get you very far. I mean, four or five years gets to be undesirable. Um, but if there is um, great commonality amongst people as to what they want, and then that's not what an election's about. An election is about rather more about the delivery um, and uh, where you've seen countries where um, there has been that uh, very strong sense of a common understanding about what they're trying to do, my favorite example is sort of Ireland in the 80s and 90s, um, then uh, that's, a, that's a very different approach to the electoral cycle, um, which would be quite, quite terrific. And that's why, of course, the Zero Carbon Act is going to be fundamentally important this year because um, <laughs> that has to be all party for it to work, and there's still some work to be done to make sure it is all party, um, but that would be a, a, yes. a terrifically good example of how, how we would then be doing that. Um, time for another a gentleman at the back there. Um, oh, sorry, there's a microphone over there. Thank you, for, thank you very much indeed. Gentleman in the far corner, thank you. Kia ora. Uh, Jason Marero. Um, firstly, I just want to applaud the tenacity of the work that you are doing in the corporate community. And, and I also hear the MCs, um, well, how, how you informed us about the leadership that the corporate community in this country is taking in terms of the world uh, when it comes to climate change. Um, I was, I was looking at your, all the members that are a part of this, this collective and um, I notice Naitahu is up there um, and probably the only Māori or iwi-led group that's a, a part of that. My, my, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I'll ask my first question because it's dependent on the answer whether how my second question goes. Um, and the first question is, is where is mana whenua or Māori uh, knowledge around climate change and what's happening in our environment? Uh, where is that knowledge in terms of informing the work that you do as a collective? That's a great question. So um, how I would describe it from the Sustainable Business Council's point of view is that we are really very much on the journey. Um, so are you talking about kind of concepts of mātauranga Māori and that feeding into the way we're thinking about things? Yeah, because I think that, that uh, we have scientists mm. who have been doing this for a long time. Māori have been doing this since the moment we, we, yeah. we, we, were, we arrived here, or for some of us, you know, we were already here. So in terms of that aspect, yeah. Yeah, so, so there are sort of two, two pieces of answers to this. One is that the Climate Leaders Coalition is a, is a coalition of the willing. So it's, it's more about um, how you display 
um, collective leadership and act as a beacon of leadership for New Zealanders but also for other businesses and so it's actually it doesn't do a great deal it's about what the businesses are doing down and in and then collectively together so there isn't um, I wouldn't describe it as there being a whole bunch of thought and forming that if you like most of that's coming from the expertise which exists inside those businesses already and a lot of the businesses have um, very um, very smart, capable um, sustainability managers and climate change experts. So the Climate Leaders Coalition sort of exists more as the as the collective vehicle, um, which isn't a re which is in no way to say that um, finding a way of integrating Te Ao Māori is being important. And I think that's a that's a journey we're on. There's a there's a group of um, the CEOs who are that kind of came up with the initial um, the initial pledge. And one of the things which they have asked to, to do continually over time is to bring other stakeholders into the conversation. And one of the things that they're intending to do is to try and meet with the iwi chairs to make sure that we are connecting to all parts of New Zealand. In terms of the work we do as the Sustainable Business Council, we're really aware that um, this is a big gap in our knowledge. And so we actually spent uh, last week half a day doing our some of our training in Te Ao Māori because we recognise we need to find a way of um, bringing that knowledge and experience into our work too. So on a journey um, and only really at the beginning. Thank you. No second question. <laughs> um, a, um, the microphone... Oh, g gentleman there. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my question is about timing. Um, if we'd started on this journey to... Mm zero carbon always sounds to me a bit ambitious, but anyway, at low carbon, by mid-century. If we'd started back when Kyoto happened, 20-something years ago, then we would have had to reduce our emissions by maybe one, maybe a little higher, percent per year, year on year. And that seems to me to be doable. But we've pissed away two decades, and now we're looking at 2% to 3%. And if we don't get going soon, that's going to be... So from a business point of view, mm -hmm. does that sort of number frighten you in terms of the sort of level of investment and actual change that could be involved in order to keep with the program? Terrifies the pants off me. Um, and and I think it's increasingly well understood by our business community what the what the scale of the transition is and how quickly we will need to decarbonise. What I'd also say is that um, a bunch of those businesses that signed up to the Climate Leaders Coalition have been working on reducing their emissions and their emissions intensity for um, tens of years, and so you know. It, it looks like they're suddenly coming out of the woodwork, but actually there's been a whole bunch of work going on this on on this for, for many, many years from many of those businesses. Um, you know, I think our business leaders are, one of the critical things for them is about how they can come together and think about doing this together because we're all in each other's supply chains. So our ability to get to the number you're talking about is gonna rely on us working together and learning from each other and bringing in um, knowledge from other places in the world who are doing this quickly too. And we need the policy settings which help create the context for us to go faster. Thank you. There's a lady at the back there, right in the centre there. Thank you. While we're waiting for the microphone to work, could you all please just turn to your neighbour and say hello? I'm really conscious that one of the things that does create community is making sure we've said hello to the people who are sitting near us. Yes, it has. I did mention that at the beginning and forgot. Uh, Hang on a second. Look, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a, a huge amount of pent up. Um, so I'm just going to hold my hand up here because it seems to work. Yeah. Look, uh, I, I really appreciate that Abby asked to do a wonderful thing because um, I think there's so much we all uh, desperately want to talk about and we've sat here terribly contained all morning. So uh, there, was, there was a wonderful tidal wave of connection there. <laughs> 
Um, but morning tea is coming up, which will be an even better time because you'll have food and drink to sustain you on that. So we're all set to go with our next, spe uh, next question at the back, please. Thank you. Um, it's really heartening to hear about um, the commitment to a low carbon future, but I think your point about, you know, two or three percent per annum um, and the difficulties of that. So I'm really asking this community and you as leaders to really start to bring to the fore in this conversation, not just a low carbon conversation, but a carbon sequestration conversation. And, um, and really for us to up the ante um, as a community to really look at delivering agricultural and horticultural um, outcomes using regenerative agriculture. So um, I really think that we can take seriously um, regenerative agricultural systems as the other half of the conversation and they need to be done in partnership. So I'm interested from you as to what you're observing within companies like Fonterra, some of our big leaders in this space as to do you feel hopeful that they have the ability to act and have the will to act in this um, using these strategies to really ensure that we have economic prosperity in terms of our exports too, as other countries start to require that kind of product. Um, yeah, and that's my question to you. So I am starting to see the regenerative agricultural conversation turn up, um, and I know of a couple of businesses who are really proactively looking at integrating that into their strategies. So I, I think the conversation is alive. Um, I don't, I'm not close to it though, so probably can't give you the detail in terms of the pace. Um, I think the sense of urgency, I, I spend a lot of time with our sustainability manager community um, and I know that they are feeling the sense of urgency to a profound degree and the, the, the level of leadership that these people show inside their businesses is, is extraordinary and, and often to personal cost. So I do feel really comfortable that our businesses get the scale and the pace at which we're going to need to move. Um, I think the thing that I've observed which gives me the greatest hope is that um, that this is a systems issue and that we've we've you know we've got so much of the system that needs to shift we need policy to change we need culture to change we need our norms to change we need the way we talk to each other to change we need our picture of what a good life is to change and what gives me hope is the is that I'm starting to see all of that happen um, the climate change conversation was not one we were having regularly with business even two years ago. The fact that we've been able to move this community at that pace, I think is a real testament to our ability to move and respond quickly. And so these are the things that are the signs of our ability to do it. What I would also say though, is that one of the things which will become challenging for business, and in some cases already is, is we are going to need the policy settings which support the voluntary action um, business can only get so far doing it for itself without actually having government come in behind and figure out what it's going to need to do in, of, in terms of setting the right policy settings for us. So we kind of need that. And every time I see our climate change minister, I do tell him that, that um, we probably don't want to wait for too much longer. Thank you. Uh, just a, a, a personal request, if I may. Um, I spend a, a great deal of my time on regenerative agricultural issues. Could you come and see me afterwards? I'd love to connect with you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I can, it's the, the lights are so bright, I can't actually see who I was talking to, <laughs> which is why I asked them to come and find me instead. I wasn't being lazy. <laughs> um, I might have invited about five people back yeah. there. <laughs> It'll be a party. It's good. Um, so look, uh, uh, this is a wonderful conversation, but uh, at the risk of derailing, derailing uh -oh. the program, uh -oh. we should stop at this point. Um, a very uh, big hand to Abby, please, for all her work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, uh, the international um, perspective is incredibly important. Um, C40 is a, a, a really important organization, originally 40 cities, um, started by M Michael Bloomberg, uh, now far more than 40. Uh, Auckland is one of them. Um, we had originally hoped to have um, the uh, deputy executive director of C40 cities himself here, uh, Kevin Austin, but he instead, instead he's had to send a video. Um, but we're going to show you two videos. The first one, they're both very short. The first one is about C40, so it explains um, 
what its purpose is and gives some examples of cities and, and the sort of things they're doing. So even if you know C40s, you, I'm sure there'll be some new things in there for you. And then we'll go straight from that um, to the uh, short video from Kevin, who's, uh, say, Deputy Executive Director of C40. So um, videos, please. Thank you. As usual in society, when things go wrong, it's always the poorest of the poor that suffer. So, so climate change is, is, is a reality that whatever you do, how you design, what projects you want to do, you have to include climate change as a factor. I've seen the projections. We understand what it means for a city like this. We have to keep building our plan farther out and farther out and farther out because we literally have to protect our people. We have to protect our way of life. It's really essential stuff. We don't have to choose between social goals or quality of life goals or environment goals. They are the same. Si nous n'incluons pas la totalité de la, de la population, nous n'arriverons pas à résoudre le défi climatique. Part of the urgency of this issue is that cities are leading. Cities are leading on climate, but they're also leading on these issues of income inequality. If there is a way to combine social equity with environmental responsibility, that is powerful. This year is on track to be the warmest yet on record. The new figures on global wealth and income disparity, and they are so shocking it takes a while for them to sink in. At least 40 people are dead after a massive landslide in Colombia. Hurricane Sandy crashing on shore. More than 9 out of 10 people worldwide live in areas with excessive air pollution. 15,000 deaths because they were living at homes they couldn't afford to heat. If the warming continues, an additional 100 million people will be plunged into poverty. We're a coastal city. We're talking about huge amounts of public housing. Some of the poorest people in this city uh, live in Manhattan uh, below 14th Street. Uh, all of that is immediately threatened by climate change. This area is profoundly vulnerable. So we're setting up a, a comprehensive set of uh, resiliency measures, literally a, a loop around a lower Manhattan to protect it uh, for decades to come to recognize the progression of the threat and actually set up the physical kind of barriers we need. I think it's dual purpose. One is the uh, employing uh, the energy consultants from low-income families and through them we can make uh, the many humble homes uh, energy efficient. So it's like you know, catching two birds by one stone. L'idée, c'est de montrer aux habitants que on peut se réapproprier la ville autrement. Euh, se déplacer, c'est très important, mais la ville doit être pacifiée également. Et le fait de d'avoir des moments ou des espaces géographiques importants sans voiture ou avec moins de voiture participe aussi euh, d'une ville plus apaisée. We had a situation where we um, had to look at houses that were built uh, 10, 15 years ago, no ceilings, no waterproofing. The impact socially on the people living inside there they have got chest problems, it's cold in winter, it's damp in winter, and that's why we took the initiative to retrofit and put ceilings in all of those houses. We have retrofitted 8,000 homes, and that will lead to a reduction of 5,600 tons of carbon emission. The climate crisis is a crisis. It is the most significant fundamental crisis that we will face as people. 
but they're real opportunities in climate responsibility. You know, we have to accept the past and we have to honor the past, but I'm a strong believer that you can design your own future. Il faut considérer que les êtres humains font partie de cette planète et que la pauvreté est un frein justement à euh, la résolution. The job of mayor is not guaranteeing the prosperity of current generation, but the next generation. fight against climate change has the possibility of unifying us, has the possibility of concentrating our energies and allowing us to think about rebuilding our society, reshaping our society, and just in time for us to address an inequality crisis which is reaching very dangerous proportions. A city is only a means to a way of life. A great city can help people not feel inferior or excluded. We are creating a way of life. Cities are the drivers of change around the world. And if you want to counter or deal with the effects of climate change, it needs to be in cities. The challenges of cities are changing rapidly. As we use more of that very finite resource of clean drinking water, as we create more waste, we're going to have to think very differently. On behalf of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, I would like to thank Auckland for inviting us to say a few words at the Auckland Climate Summit 2019. Now it's clear that cities must act now to limit global temperature rise through actions to reduce emissions from the energy, transport and waste sectors, and at the same time deliver measures to increase our resilience to climate change. In doing so, I must commend Auckland and particularly Mayor Goff for his leadership in the global climate agenda. Not only is the city committed to carbon neutrality, but they're putting these commitments into action, which not only acts against climate change, but helps to clean the air, tackle inequality, and create new high quality jobs. We are eager to see how you will shape the five flagship actions presented this week actions that unlock the decentralised renewable energy, that develop blue-green infrastructure, that help build increased innovation in the climate field, that make the city centre climate ready and create a circular economy in the construction and demolition sectors. We very much look forward to working with you in partnership to build on these and the wider actions in this area. But cities can't do this alone, and we commend all parties that are making this happen. The New Zealand Government, the New Zealand Climate Leaders Coalition, businesses, community groups, and other institutions. The programme reflects an informed and meaningful climate conversations as it considers health, the just transition, intergenerational equity, and the Maori worldview as well as the range of benefits beyond reducing emissions and preparing for climate impacts. From C40, we applaud the work that Auckland has done to date and are very excited for your journey ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, that gives you a bit of a flavour of what C40 is up to. Um, and whilst, as I said, these are truly global issues, we'll find our own expression in solving them. And I couldn't help imagine um, a more beautiful backdrop um, behind uh, 
people uh, videoing out from Auckland to the world um, than was obviously uh, Kevin's handicap in New York City, <laughs> which was a pretty fearsome backdrop. Um, uh, one public service announcement before morning tea. If anybody parked their bike out front on the blue bike rack, I'd seriously advise you to go and move your bike because as Janet and I found when we locked up our bikes this morning, it is a piece of Lego that pulls apart. And therefore, any you think you've locked your bike to a full, a, a, you know, a, a robust structure, but somebody could come along and just pull it apart and they still have to wheel your heavy electric bike away, which would be difficult, but still do go and repark. Uh, further down, uh, but there are also some um, um, rather more permanent silver ones out front, uh, which can't be pulled apart. Morning tea's out there. We're coming back at 10.45 to get stuck into the Climate Action Plan itself, so lots of uh, more to come. See you at uh, 10.45. Thanks very much indeed.